Got to check that. Well, good morning. So last week we celebrated Easter and the resurrection of Christ, and Pastor Jim talked to us last week about what Christ's resurrection means for us. Namely, that if we believe in Jesus Christ, that he's our Lord and our Savior, that we too can look forward one day to resurrection. Now, for, this means that for Christ followers, that death isn't an end. It's not this absolute stop. In Christ, we're promised an eternity with our loving God. But for most of us, death and this promised resurrection into eternity probably isn't going to happen anytime soon. And we don't know when Christ will return and when this resurrection will actually happen. So that brings us to this question of, what about now? What do we do now as we eagerly and expectantly await the return of Christ and our resurrection and eternity? And as Pastor Jim shared last week, the only thing that we have to do is believe. And that's true. But believing and trusting in Jesus Christ is life-changing. Here at Community Church, we talk about lives transformed by Christ. So what we're going to talk about this morning isn't what we have to do, it's what we will do and what we are blessed to do. This morning, I'd like us to consider a little part of what it looks like to live a life transformed by Christ. I'd like us to think about what God tells us in the Bible what follows after our belief, the ways that our lives and our actions are changed because of our belief. Now, we probably aren't the first people to ask the question, now what? The first people to probably ask that were probably Jesus' disciples. Our scripture passage this morning in John chapter 20 gives two short accounts of Jesus appearing to his disciples right after his resurrection. The first is in verses 19 through 23, and it happens the evening of that very first Easter. So Jesus has just been resurrected. And then the second account in verses 24 through 29 happened just one short week after that first Easter. So let's open up our Bibles to page 1,652. Again, that's 1,652. We're going to be in John chapter 20, beginning at verse 19. There we go. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. This is the word of the Lord. So at a first glance, these two accounts in our passage this morning probably seem quite different. We read in verse 20 of the first account that the disciples were overjoyed when they saw Jesus. But in the second account, we read about old, doubting Thomas, who simply refuses to believe until he sees and touches the holes in Jesus' hands and puts his hand in Jesus' side. And again, these seem radically different. In this first account, we have the disciples who are overjoyed, but in the second, we have 
a doubting Thomas insisting on proof. But let's take a closer look. So in verse 19, there we go. In verse 19, the disciples were gathered together behind locked doors and they were cowering in fear. But then Christ miraculously appears to them. Jesus speaks to them and he blesses them with peace and with his Holy Spirit. And he tells them that he is sending them just as God the Father has sent him. But then we get to verse 26. It's a week later. It's seven days after these same disciples have already seen the risen Christ and expressed their joy. But here again, these same disciples, now with Thomas, are behind locked doors. They haven't gone anywhere. They haven't left the house. They haven't left even the locked room. Now we give Thomas a hard time nicknaming him Doubting Thomas. But what about these other disciples? Until Christ appeared to them on that first Easter morning, they were cowering in fear behind locked doors. The only difference between these disciples and Doubting Thomas is that Tom, Thomas actually spoke his doubt aloud but the other disciples were living their doubt. And so here they are, a week after Christ has already appeared to them, still behind locked doors. They expressed their belief and their joy at seeing Jesus, enough that they shared this experience with Thomas, which prompted his doubt. But these disciples aren't living that belief. But the disciples aren't alone in this struggle to actually live out their belief, to be moved to action by faith in a risen Christ. And the tricky thing about this inaction, this fixed belief, is that it can happen in a million different ways. It's the small, thoughtless things that we aren't doing. It's the situations and the people that we see each and every day that we mindlessly turn a blind eye to. It's almost like we go about our day living with this tunnel vision, our sight firmly fixed on whatever tasks we've set for ourselves for that day. There we go. It's the coworker walking up to the door with arms full of office supplies, clearly about to struggle to open up that door, and we see them, but we keep walking, thinking, oh, they'll figure it out, or, well, if I stop and I help them now, I'm going to be late to my meeting. Or it's the elderly neighbor who struggles just to get to the end of her driveway to get to her mailbox to get her mail each day, and we see her struggle, and, but we keep saying, oh, I'll, I'll help tomorrow when I go to get my mail. But tomorrow comes and goes, and we still don't help that neighbor. Or it's the homeless veteran on a street corner, a man who has served his country with honor, but brought the horrors of war home with them in his mind, and now he struggles to keep a job, enough to make money so that he can eat. And we see him on the corner, but we keep driving past. Or it's the quiet kid who sits alone in a cafeteria without a friend, day in and day out, but we don't go over and sit with him and talk to him, because if we do, our friends might think that we're the weird ones too. Now, friends, we might not be cowering behind locked doors, tucked away somewhere in Jerusalem, fearing the persecution of Jewish leaders. And we might not express our doubt and demand physical proof like poor Thomas did. But too often, just like these disciples, it's the things that we aren't doing, the things that are absent from our lives that contradict the belief that we profess. Now, in his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone, who sees, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. The key word here is does. It's belief in action. It is faith on the move. Our faith doesn't start and end with mere words. Our faith flows out of us and it shapes our actions and our choices. It shapes the things that we do in accordance with the will of God. 
Faith and belief is when we echo Jesus in saying, not what I want, God, but what you want, and actually doing what God wants us to do. Now, thankfully, our scripture passage this morning doesn't just show us where we fall short like what the disciples did. Our passage this morning tells us two things about living out lives that are transformed by Christ, lives that are pushed by the belief, by our belief into action. And the first thing that our passage tells us is this, that Christ empowers those who follow him, those who dedicate their lives to him with his peace. So let's take another look at the passage this morning. Not once, not twice, but three times Jesus greets his disciples with peace be with you. But this peace that Jesus was greeting and blessing his disciples with probably isn't what you and I think of when we think of peace. The New Testament, including our scripture passage this morning, was originally written in Greek. And in Greek, Jesus' blessing of peace was written as Irene Human, which was probably the closest Greek equivalent of the Hebrew, um, let me read it, Shalom Aleichem. Now, Shalom Aleichem was probably a very common greeting between Jews in that day. And so it's reasonable that Jesus' disciples overlooked it when his first greeting to them was, peace be with you. It's a common greeting, and then on top of that, They were probably amazed because there was a guy who they saw die standing before them in a locked room. But not only are these words, the very first words that Jesus speaks to his disciples in saying, peace be with you, he repeats it three times, and there seems to be two reasons why he repeats this. The first reason why Jesus repeatedly blesses his disciples with peace of all things is because he had promised them his peace before he was crucified and before he died. Knowing that his disciples would be scared and confused when he died on the cross, Jesus promised his disciples his peace. So in John chapter 14, verse 21, Jesus says to his disciples, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And then in John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus is again telling his disciples about his crucifixion and death. And he says this to them, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Now, what stands out in both of these short verses before Jesus' crucifixion and what stands out in our passage this morning as well, when Jesus actually delivers on those promises, is this, that it's the peace of Jesus, not the peace of the world, but the peace of Jesus that is given to his followers. The world thinks of peace as the absence of war, the absence of violence, the absence of suffering. But that's not the peace that Jesus promises and delivers to his followers. The peace of Jesus is a robust peace, a peace of the spirit that persists even during times of suffering and during times of violence and during times of war. Jesus even tells his followers that you will have trouble in this world, and yet he is still promising this peace. The peace born of Christ is a peace that endures the troubles of today and of tomorrow and of every day until Christ returns. Christ's peace, this true peace, the shalom in this Hebrew greeting that we read, is a comprehensive peace that looks beyond today to to the day when Christ will make all things new again. It's the peace that bears the pain and the sadness and the brokenness of today with resilience and with the certainty that Christ has already won a victory over that pain and over that sadness and over that brokenness through his death and resurrection. When Christ appears to his disciples and he says, peace be with you, it is the prince of peace himself. It is Christ empowering those who believe in him 
to begin to live into this new reality with a victorious ending. And that victorious ending is our resurrection into eternity that Pastor Jim spoke of last week. That victory and that ending is assured. And everything between now and then we can handle knowing that we are blessed with the peace of Christ. And friends, Jesus is offering the same comprehensive victorious peace this morning as he did with his disciples 2,000 years ago. Jesus empowers everyone who believes in him, including you and I, with his peace. And it's through his Holy Spirit that Christ shares his peace with each and every one of us. But just like belief in Christ is more than mere spoken words, the peace of Christ is a little bit more complex. It would probably even be fair to say that the peace of Christ in us is even a little bit more demanding. Belief in Christ is transformative. Those who have faith and believe that Christ is our Lord and Savior are changed. And the peace of Christ that flows from this belief is peace with a purpose. Jesus empowers us through the Holy Spirit with his peace for a reason. Now remember that verse from Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, that says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father. So remember that emphasis on doing and not just on saying what we believe. And remember verse 21 of our passage this morning from John chapter 20. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Now friends, this is the reason, this is the purpose for which Christ empowers us with his peace. It's to go out into the world. It's peace with a reason and with a purpose. Christ fills us with his peace so that we're equipped to be sent out into a troubled world. But this still leaves us with a question. It doesn't fully answer what we're supposed to do between now and the end when Christ returns and we're resurrected. We've talked about believing and how Christ blesses his believers with this awesome, all-encompassing peace. And we've talked about how Christ empowers us with that peace so that we can go out into the world despite all of the brokenness that we encounter. But what do we do once we've gone? What do we do once Christ has empowered us with his peace and we go out, we're sent out, filled with the Holy Spirit and wrapped in Christ's peace out into the world? What now? What does it matter that we have Christ's peace? And then now what? The big answer to what Christ calls us and sends us out to do is to be his agents of peace, to act as his agents of peace. So remember that Christ's peace isn't the same as the world's peace. It's this comprehensive thing, and that means that acting as Christ's agents of peace is also a comprehensive thing. It means extending and sharing the peace and love of Christ to everyone that we encounter and in all aspects of our lives, whether at work, at school, when we're out shopping, whether we're at the gym. Being an agent of Christ's peace isn't a nine-to-five job. It's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. You are an agent of Christ's peace, and you should be acting on it. And this means that you hold the door for that coworker who starts coming up with their arms full and you know that they can't open it themselves. It means going out each day to help your elderly neighbor get her mail. It means sitting with that lonely kid in the cafeteria and becoming their friend. It means stopping and helping that homeless veteran on the street corner. It means doing all of those little daily things that we so often are blind to. It means breaking out of this selfish tunnel vision that we have and actually paying attention to those around us. It means following Christ's example in feeding the hungry, giving shelter to the homeless, clothing the naked, visiting the sick, visiting those in prison, and friending those without a friend, and doing all of these things in the name of Christ. Believing in Christ 
being filled with the Holy Spirit and with the peace of Christ and heading out into the world to fulfill this purpose, this mission that God has granted us as his agents of peace and love to a desperate world. This, friends, is what Christ calls us to in the here and now, in the today, as we look forward to eternity and resurrection. We're called to belief, peace, and purpose. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks for this morning, and we give you thanks that you have blessed us, that in our belief that you respond with Christ's peace, not with a, a weak and simple peace that the world speaks of, but this comprehensive peace of Christ that prepares us to head out into a world that is so broken and that is so desperate for your peace and for your love. We pray that you'll continue blessing us with this peace and we pray that you will remind us each and every day that you have called us to belief in action, that you have granted us and blessed us with this peace for a purpose, Lord, so that we can be your good witnesses to the world, that we can be a light in the darkness and that amidst the brokenness and the desperation of the Lord, we can, of the world, we can share your peace and your love. Grant us your Holy Spirit this morning, Lord, and fill us with your peace. And we pray all these things in the name of our risen Lord and Savior. Amen.